Welcome to episode nine of Staying in the House, powered by GopherHole.com. I'm Daniel House. One of my favorite things about Gopher Baseball is the history of the program. Over 132 seasons, Minnesota's featured all-time great athletes, iconic coaches like Dick Siebert and John Anderson. And this tradition of excellence has been passed down through generations. Siebert led the Gophers for 31 seasons, reached the College World Series five times, and won three NCAA titles. Anderson was entering his 39th season in 2020 and is the all-time winningest coach in Big Ten baseball history. Following the 2019 season, he ranked 23rd on the NCAA Division I all-time wins list with 1,317. It would take an entire video to just list all 14's accolades. John has developed so many top athletes on the field and off of it and is just one of the best coaches in college baseball. I loved having him on the show. Let's roll the video. 14, thanks for stopping by. Great to be here, Daniel. Thanks for having me. How are you holding up during quarantine without baseball? Everything going okay? Well, it's been quite different for me. Uh, been about 45 years, at least in the college game, when I've been at, uh, at the ballpark at this time of the year and engaged in, in uh, coaching young men uh, in the game of baseball and competing and, and going through that part of your uh, year-long experience uh, as a head coach. Uh, in our game. So it's, it's definitely been different. Um, obviously, uh, we have to, uh, uh adjust. Um, I think I, as I told the players, I think it's an opportunity for us to really get somewhat of a dose of reality. You're not promised uh, the next opportunity tomorrow or the next day, or when you get a chance to put the uniform on, it's, it's a blessing and it's a gift and, uh, you shouldn't take it for granted. And, and hopefully, uh, I think we can emerge from this and, and having a healthier perspective about, while we put the uniform on and, and, and go to college to learn and grow and get a degree and compete at the highest level. But at the same time, it's, it's, it's not guaranteed. And so um, what we can learn from this, I think, is just to, just to grab a healthier perspective and that attitude of gratitude that you have a chance to play the game at this level. And it's a, it's a short career and, and, and it goes quickly and, and hopefully we can emerge and get back at it and we have a different perspective, at least in terms of how we go about uh, competing going forward here. So this season started and ended abruptly. You swept a series at U.S. Bank Stadium. You were preparing for a trip for Air Force. And right before that, COVID-19 caused everything to come to a screeching halt. How difficult was it to break that news to your players that the spring season was ending and you guys weren't going to be able to finish what you started? Well, it was hard to look out uh, at the group of young men in our team meeting room and, and really uh, have this conversation. Uh, obviously, you could see the... Uh, emotionally that they were obviously disappointed and uh, uh, some of them were hoping that maybe this was only going to last for a little while. There were questions about, well, this won't be the whole season. Will it just be temporary? And I think everybody was hoping for a better outcome or an outcome that potentially would give us an opportunity to, to restart the season. And um, so I think and they were in shock initially, uh, although the night before we finished our game with, with Creighton at the U.S. Bank Stadium and and I'd seen some of the events, the NBA had canceled their season. And I told them that night, I said, anything's possible now going forward and plan to leave tomorrow. And, and, and the bus is going to leave at 1130 and be packed up and we're going to get out of here. But uh, you know, we could not leave and we could get to Colorado and not play and the season could continue or it could, could end. And so I tried to warn them that I, I thought at that time there was a, a lot of possibilities and, and it didn't look like many of them were going to be very good once the NBA canceled their season. So it was really, really disappointing, and we talk all the time about controlling the controllables, and this is something we can't control. It was the right thing to do, and there's bigger issues out there than us playing baseball, and uh, I, I just encourage them to finish up their semester strong. It was going to be different. I think the other part of it is people forget is they're missing a semester on campus going through their college experience, and just with other students out there at the university and those experiences with come going to class and all the things around that. Uh, they're missing out on a whole semester. And and uh, I know I was in college way back when, but that would be disappointing. And I guess if there's a silver lining at all, we only had one senior, even though that one senior is is, is pretty important person, but Jordan Kazaki. So we didn't have eight or 10 of them. We have to try to figure out what they're going to do going forward. We just had one, but I feel for Jordan. He's a fifth year senior and uh, wrestled with coming back in the beginning just because he didn't need more education, but he did. And then to have it cut short, uh, uh, obviously, uh, that, uh, that, uh, hurt me a little bit, but, uh, that, as I said, there's, there's not much we can do about it other than 
get some perspective and move on. And Kazaki played so many positions for you guys and had such a big impact on the program during his career. So it's obviously got to be difficult going to a guy like that and saying season's ending, your final year just abruptly ends like that. With all that going on, have you been able to stay in touch with the players virtually? We have. We've done some of that. Um, my assistants have uh, weekly meetings uh, with the guys, and uh, I've made con connections more individually uh, rather than trying to get the whole group together all the time. The, our hitting coach, Pat Casey, has, has kind of rounded up the position players once a week, and Ty McDevitt, our pitching coach, and Brandon Hunt, our volunteer, have have uh, connected with the guys weekly and, and had meetings and have the guys check in. I know our guys stay connected routinely through, uh, you know, uh, some of the virtual sites as well as our group uh, text message uh, that we have. And, and so um, I think, uh, but again, I think we told the guys, this is an opportunity to practice overcoming adversity. And that's a big part of our game. There's lots of failure. There's lots of adversity. So this is an opportunity to practice how to handle uh, adversity. And, and uh, I think for the most part, our guys are doing well and they're finishing up school here and, positive way and and uh you know i think uh, once again I, I think we've tried to prepare them for the fact that uh you know there's adversity in life and everything doesn't go your way and you better learn how to deal with it and as i said this is just another opportunity to do that how have you helped maintain the skills of your players through the workout programs and, and different baseball things that they'd normally be doing have you sent them a lot of stuff to to do over the course of the next couple of months depending upon what happens not really from a baseball perspective. And I know there's some that are doing some things based on what they have access to in terms of facilities, but our season's so far off right now that um, really um, there's not a lot they can do because they don't have a facility to go to to do it. So, you know, now you can be outside and I'm sure some have gone out and if they can find somebody to hit them a ground ball or take some BP, I'm sure some of that's going on. It's not being mandated by us necessarily. Now there are some things they can do. Um, you know, that impact not just their baseball career, but their lives is, is, is work on uh, their mental game. And, uh, you know, working on, on, on uh, we, have a, we have some programming that we do in terms of pitch recognition and, and, and the videos and things you can do online. And we, we have a program that they can work on tracking pitches and making decisions on, on pitches out of the pitcher's hand. And so there's some visual training and there's some mental game stuff they can do. That's really, really important. I've said many times our game to Division One level is – you know, 80% of it's from the neck up and, and how you manage your experience and, and being able to slow the game down and, and, and being able to hitting is a visual skill and being able to use your eyes to identify pitches and, and types of pitches and movement and in the zone. Um, doing those types of things probably right now is just as, as critical as doing some physical work. And uh, I'm sure many of them are, are active in different ways and working on different things. Uh, we have had a really highly uh, internally motivated group this year. And so I'm sure they are doing some things. We have asked them to move their bodies around and, and at least do some things in, in terms of moving their body weight and, and, and push ups and sit ups and pull ups and different things that they can do and, and keeping their bodies in shape. I think that's more important right now. The baseball skills will come, but don't let your body get too far down the road and out of shape. It's going to make it more difficult when the time comes to ramp up activity to get going again. So, um, and some of them have played catch, and some of the pitchers have continued to, to, to play some sort of catch. But it's just the unknown. We don't know when we're going to start up. We're hoping for the fall, obviously. And and once we know we're coming back in the fall, then we'll give them more prescribed programs in terms of what we want them to do so they can come back and be in some sort of shape to get started in the fall. Because we've missed out on a big window of player development time right here with the season being canceled. Summer seasons have been canceled, so the kids aren't going to get player development time then. So we're going to be way behind, and we're going to have to try to make up that time. And most importantly, they need to come back in some kind of shape when we get started again so we can try to make up for some of the lost ground. I watched a few of your games before the season ended and had the chance to see Max Meyer pitch. I know many experts have him ranked as a top-10 prospect. Could become the first Minnesota player selected in the first round since Glenn Perkins in 2004. Where do you think he's grown the most over the course of his career? I think Max, you know, always had the wipeout slider. I think he relied on that. That was always uh, that was always the difference maker for him. I think what I've seen in the three years has been his growth as becoming more invested in in, in uh, becoming a better pitcher, uh, developing his body in, in the weight room and his conditioning and finding a routine that works for himself. 
you know, we've challenged him all along. His freshman year, he was a closer, and he had to go out there and get us three to six outs. And, you know, he could throw that slider a lot. Um, and then as we transitioned into making him a starter, he had to learn how to be a pitcher and uh, be able to take his, his, his pitch count deeper into the games where he could impact the game. And so I think he's really worked hard over the last year or so, year and a half, to develop better fastball command get more people out in the first two or three pitches rather than, you know, being deep in the count and, and getting guys to chase the slider and falling it off. And, and he developed a changeup last summer. He wanted, to, he wanted to go away and pitch on the USA team, which he did as a freshman again. And we told him he could pitch once a week, 60, 65 pitches, but we wanted him to work on his changeup and fastball command and not rely on the slider. And he did that. He worked really, really hard. He came back in the fall and showed us evidence of a better changeup and, we didn't pitch him in the fall, but he did a few bullpens and played some flat ground catch. And and uh, that's what I saw is, is he's just been more engaged in the overall process of, of a daily routine that it takes to be a, a high level pitcher and advance himself into professional baseball. And he's his body's uh, he's, he's gained some weight. He's in better shape. He's 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 uh, developed a better uh, uh, three pitches now and, and better sequencing of his pitches. And he started to understand how to how to set hitters up and get hitters out rather than just relying on the slider. So there's been tremendous growth there. And most importantly, I think he's finished up this year well academically. And I challenged him last summer about, you know, you got a chance to leave next year, but I don't want you to take school lightly and just give us a half an effort. I expect you to to do your very best. And he's done that. And that's a sign of maturation and growth as well. And I told him someday you're probably going to come back and you want to leave here in good academic standing. And he's done that. And, I, and, I, and I'm proud of him for that as much as I am uh, proud of, of what he's done on the baseball field that, you know, he's handled his academic world in a, in a pretty, pretty significant way. Outside of all the stuff going on with COVID-19 and the season ending abruptly, I really wanted to focus on taking a trip down memory lane because I know Gopher fans love going back to the 70s and reflecting upon the great success that the program had with Dick Siebert. And you obviously were, were a great part of that, being a walk-on pitcher and then being a student assistant. Uh, what initially led you to the Minnesota baseball program as a walk-on? Well, first and foremost, I think if you grew up, at least in the state of Minnesota, there wasn't the national recruiting back then and the reach that there is today. Um, and, you know, uh, Dick Siebert was a legend. I mean, he he traveled around the state in the summertime and put clinics on, baseball clinics, and that's how he did some of his recruiting and scouting. And he came to our little small town in Keewat, Minnesota, up on the Iron Range and put on a, a baseball clinic for us. We had a, a very good player, Bob Balf that was a year older than I was. And he came there predominantly because he wanted And we had a Legion game after the clinic and wanted to see Bob play and work him out basically. And, and uh, Bob ended up coming to the university and got a partial scholarship and ended up being the captain on the 76 team. And, and so he came to our town. It was like the Pope coming and visiting. It was pretty special. And so every young man, boy that picked up a bat and ball in Minnesota wanted to play for Dick Siebert at the University of Minnesota and beat a Golden Gopher and play for the Minnesota Twins, at least after they got here in the 60s, and as I did. And so Bob went ahead of us, and I had another good friend, Dave Bavacqua. He went uh, after we graduated. Uh, he joined the program. I went to junior college, Hibbing Community College. I had this great desire to play college hockey and uh, of some sort. We didn't have high school hockey. I played basketball in high school. Actually, maybe it was all district, but – and we didn't have organized hockey, didn't have open enrollment. I was a rink rat. I hung out at the rink. I loved it. I played when it was 20 below zero out there, and it was pickup. We got the guys together in town of all ages, and we played on Saturdays and Sundays and at nights and flooded the rink and painted the lines. And Hibbing Community College had a hockey program, and I wanted to try to go see if I could make the team and play. And I did. I was a third, fourth-line hack, and uh, but I loved it. And uh, we had three players that went on and played Division One. We lost in the national championship game to a team out of Upper New York, Canton, Canton and uh, they, they, they kicked, a, they had a bunch of 24, 25 year old Canadians that were pretty good and they kicked us around pretty good in the championship game, but uh, I loved it. And uh, so then after that, I was playing amateur baseball with Bob and Dave in, in Marble, Minnesota, and I wanted to go to the university and try to play baseball. I played football, hockey, and baseball at Hibbing Community College and then um, wrote Dick Siebert a letter and still have a copy of it actually. Wow. Uh, I asked him if I could walk on, and uh, and I got a, a reply back that I could. And, of course, he, they had 60, 70 guys out there in the fall, and and uh, so it wasn't like it was a big deal. I got an opportunity, and 
pitched okay in the fall. And actually, we had two fields, the JV field, JV back then, and the varsity field. And the guys that play in the JV field, the old the old Delta field, were called chipmunks. And the Gophers <laughs> were on the other field. And the chipmunks <laughs> didn't even walk through, uh, at that time, Beerman Field. You had to go around to get to the other field. You weren't allowed on there unless you were invited. Wow. If you're in the fall ball, I pitched well enough over there with the chipmunks. I got an opportunity to come over and uh, pitch on the varsity field. And, well, I remember I got knocked around pretty good. Um, I think Paul Molitor hit one off uh, out on me. And I tease people all the time. They didn't have to rake the infield. They just had to rake the warning track because that's where all the action was out there. But I pitched okay. And then uh, pitched once on the spring trip the next year. I had an arm injury and really thought about leaving and going to play hockey at Division two or three or someplace. And I was in Dick Siebert's coaching class and, and uh, had the highest grade ever in there. And he tried to flunk everybody. It was a really difficult class. Um, and, he, and I wanted to be a teacher and a coach. And he said, why don't you stay here and help me if you want to be a coach? He had arthritis and couldn't hit the fungal anymore and really limited physically. And he said, why don't you stay and, I'll, you know, you can learn how to, to coach baseball and I'll help you find a job when you graduate someplace in high school. So I chose – I had a lot of good friends and I loved the program and I decided to stay. And uh, – Probably the best decision I ever made in my young life. Didn't know this was going to happen. I didn't run write an eighth grade, uh, you know, uh, occupation paper or career paper about being a baseball coach in Division One baseball. But um, you know, time means everything. And I hung around and stayed, and I got an opportunity. I called. I got a chance to work with. What maybe you look at it as a as a great surgeon that you got to to, to do an uh, interim or, or work beside to, to learn your profession and. And then George Thomas was the assistant, and he was a great baseball mind, played 10 years in the major leagues and played uh, in the Gopher program for one year. And so I got a baseball experience and a chance to learn from two great coaches. And uh, and then uh, one thing led to another, and Dick got sick and eventually passed away in 1978, December, and George was the assistant. And he became the head coach. He offered me the assistance. We were both part-time, believe it or not, worked on the outside. And uh, – uh, we did that for three years, and then George decided to leave. Uh, he had he decided to go into business. He didn't want to do it part time any longer. They wouldn't make it full time. Paul Gill was the athletic director, and lo and behold, I was available and I was cheap. And so uh, Paul Gill gave me an opportunity in the fall of, 90, of 1981, and here we are. Who'd have guessed? I've been walking out to the same you know, Seabird Field now, the same area for since 1974 in the fall. So who would have known? But it's been a great ride. Uh, lots of history and tradition. Lots of things have happened, but been really blessed. So when you wrote him a letter wanting to walk on at the University of Minnesota, what did he say back when he wrote wrote back to you? I got a form letter back basically that said, yeah, here's when tryouts are show up and we'll give you an opportunity. And But actually when I came down, I, I Bob Balf and Dave Bavak were in the program. So Bob, Bob was one of Chief's favorites. And uh, actually some of the guys used to te- tease him and call him Bobby Siebert. <laughs> because when they needed something, they sent Bobby in there to talk to the chief, and he would he'd usually get his way. So, and Dick had a book with a little little uh, 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 young uh, boy uh, picture of him fielding the ground ball, and one of the guys took his book one time and crossed out Bob, and put Bobby Siebert in there instead of the young boy in terms of that. So Bobby took me in there and in- introduced me to the chief. That was my first introduction, and uh, and actually I was sitting there with Bobby, and all of a sudden Paul Molitor came by, and he was. He was his first year in the program, and, and he's a year younger than I was a sophomore. He was a freshman. And Paul had the long hair from the 70s, and he looked like he was in a rock band. And, <laughs> and I know he's and, and Dick had cataracts, and he had trouble seeing uh, long distances, and he had just one little light on the desk. And Paul stuck his head in the door, and, and he said hello. And, and Chief looked at him, and he said, who the hell is that? <laughs> He said, Paul Molitor, and he said, well, let me tell you something, Paul. He said, we got we got stiffer rules around here than the Oakland A's, so you better get that haircut <laughs> if you want to be on the team. And that was my first introduction to Dick Siebert and, and Paul Molitor. And and uh, uh, um, and back then, the Oakland A's had the long hair and the mustaches and the whole thing in the 70s, and that was his comment, is we got stricter rules around there, and that's who you better get your hair cut and shave that beard. So uh, I'll never forget that story sitting in his office with Bobby. You pitched for two years, but then you said an injury ended your career. Then you became a student assistant. In that role, you had the chance to work with Dick Siebert. What lessons did you learn from him that now you've applied into your program as a head coach? Well, first of all, you got to understand we're a northern program, and so 
part of it involves dealing with the weather and, and you have an extensive period of time where you have to do player development inside. And uh, I think what I learned from Dick was uh, obviously, number one, he was a stickler about the, teaching kids to be able to execute the fundamentals of the game. The game's about playing catch. So you, first of all, you got to learn how to play catch. And he was a stickler for that. Started with every, every fall, started with here's the baseball, here's how you grip it. You know, here's how, you know, here's a proper throwing mechanic. So every phase of the game, he was a tremendous teacher of the fundamentals of the game, whether it was base running, whether it was cutoffs and relays, whether it was bunt defense, whether it was hitting, whether it was fielding. You have to stand in baseball. you got to teach the fundamentals of the game. you got the shortstop, the second baseman, the third baseman, the first baseman, the outfielders and catchers and pitchers. And so there's, a, there, there, there's not like you're teaching the same fundamentals to, to 35 players on your roster. And so – he was a stickler about the fundamentals. And if you were going to play for him, you had to be able to execute the fundamentals of the game. So if you couldn't get the bunt down, you weren't going to play. You better know how to bunt. If he asked you to bunt, you better be able to figure it out. You better know how to run the bases. You better know your responsibilities in team defense. You know the signs, all the different things. So he was a stickler in teaching the fundamentals. And he developed a way to teach the fundamentals and be able to develop players indoors uh, and, and he was very creative in the way he went about it and very creative in some of the drills that he came up with and how he evaluated players. He had a, a very, very detailed charting system. Whenever we hit in the cages off live pitchers or, 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 or we hit off the machines, there was charts and it was kept when the, he created a well-hit average and percentages. I remember doing a lot of those charts every night with a, with a calculator and a pencil and cutting up the columns against right-handed pitching, against left-handed pitching, against breaking balls and fastballs and change-ups and well hit averages and swings and misses and contact and and there were no computers so it was paper and pencil and he posted this stuff in the locker room and, and basically if you couldn't execute the fundamentals and do certain things based on how he evaluated you the player you didn't play and uh, so he was a stickler and what I really learned is it, the game's really not about the the, the, the the big things but all the little things can the infielders play catch with the other infielders can the outfielders hit the cutoff man can the pitcher throw strikes okay. Uh, all the little things of the game that that really impact the final score, and so he was he was a person that was really de detail oriented, down to the, the the smallest little thing. We even practiced the five man infield that you might use once every five years, but you but we we always practice it. And I think part of it was we started the beginning of January. We didn't play till the end of March. We were in that indoor field house on the dirt surface for three months. And so you had to be creative in ways to be able to keep your team engaged and develop the, the, develop their fundamentals so you could step outside and play. And, and I think it's a real testament, his career, and his success to how great of a teacher he was. And when he left, he had all these books in his office and his wife, when he passed away, brought me these books. And he read all, for a guy that played in the major leagues, he read all these books. He said, I, I played first base and pitch, but I didn't know how to teach anybody how to hit. I didn't know how to teach anybody to play shortstop. I didn't know how to teach anybody to be a catcher. So he was a student of the game. And if you went through his library, it was unbelievable. The books he read, the notes in the margins. And I remember when players came back from playing professional baseball, worked out in the field house. I remember when Dave Winfield came back, whoever, he always pulled him aside and he'd ask him, how are they teaching this? How are they teaching that? What did you learn that's different than you learned here? He never, he was a lifelong learner. And he always wanted to learn more and he never thought he knew it all. And if you could convince him there was a better way to run bun defense, he would listen to you. And he may argue with you, but at the end of the day, if you had something to say, he wanted to listen to it because he always wanted to be challenged in terms of how he taught the game. And that was impressive for me, for a guy that played in the major leagues, was a pretty good player, how open he was to learning and growth and trying to find a better way. He just became a tremendous teacher of the fundamentals of the game. And that's what I've tried to take with me throughout my career. So a lot of those player development skills probably helped produce the team that made a run to the College World Series in 1977. You finished sixth that year. You were a student assistant on that team. Paul Molitor, pitcher Dan Morgan. Uh, what do you think made that team really special and allowed them to have so much success? Well, first of all, very talented. I think there were 12 guys drafted from that team, so start there. Um, Brian Denman pitched in the big leagues, and Jerry Uger and Paul Molitor, of course, and and, uh, you know, very, 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 very talented team uh, of players. We had lost in the, in the regionals to go to Omaha on 76 to Arizona State, who had a very, very good team, Ken Landro, and they had five or six big-time major league players off of that team. And we got beat in the finals pretty good there. I think everybody that came back decided that, you know, we we're going to – we didn't care who got the credit. 
we're all going to work really, really hard. And we wanted to get to Omaha the next year. And we knew we were going to have a, quite a bit of talent returning from the year before. And, uh, you know, we lost Steve Comer, who was an outstanding pitcher from 76. He ended up pitching in the big leagues. Um, we lost some really good players, but there was a great nucleus returning. And uh, they just decided that they had a taste of it and they were close and they wanted to get to Omaha and very, very unselfish group. I think uh, they decided they had a lot of players who got, who were very, very good, who got a lot of attention. But sometimes when you have that many good players, they all want to take credit for what's going on here. And everybody just decided we don't care who gets the credit. We just want to get to the College World Series and have a chance to compete for the national championship. And that's what I remember the most. It was an unselfish group. Everybody pitched in. Everybody did their part. We had some guys sitting on the bench that were some pretty good players back then that gave you a chance to play much. That could have played on a lot of my teams that I've coached in my career here, um, but that's just the way it was. I mean, there were a lot of great players. When you came to the University of Minnesota back then, there were a lot of great players, and, and you, if you got one opportunity to perform. If you didn't perform, they went on to the next guy because there was another guy, and he there wasn't a lot of patience. For Dick Siever didn't have a lot of patience if you didn't perform right away because he had other choices, and so you better when you got a chance, you better be ready. Because if you didn't perform, you didn't know if you get another opportunity. But that's what I remember the most. Totally unselfish. And I think that was expressed. We won the championship at Iowa. We're coming home with a bus. And we always had to vote for, for MVP and different awards. And uh, Dick, I was back playing cribbage with some of the guys and having a good time. And he yelled for me to come up and get the pencils and paper and pass them out. And I did. And the guys voted. And I took him, threw him in his seat, and went back and started playing cards again. All of a sudden, he got up and said, you guys get serious now and, and we're going to vote because the guys had voted me to be the most valuable player because it, hmm. it was a non-selfish group. You couldn't pick one guy and they felt I contributed in other ways to their success by helping them in practice and doing all the little things that had to be done on a day-to-day -day basis. And he said, pass these out again. You guys get serious this time. We're not going to name this, you know, the, the, the student assistant as our MVP. So I went up, got him, passed him out again. The next time it came back unanimous. So... He said, well, I guess if that's what you guys want, that's what we'll do. I'll find out if the university will let us do it. And I think that speaks not so much to what I did, but the, but these uns, uh, how unselfish the group was. They just you, you couldn't have picked one guy out of that group. So many different players, so many good players contributed. And and uh, so it was uh, to me, that award was really about what the team was all about. Not so much about what I did, but really about sp spoke volumes to their on selfish attitude, everybody took an interest in, in others, not just themselves, and supported one another. And just shows you when nobody cares who gets, you know, credit for what happens on the field, what you can accomplish, especially if you have a group that sticks together and has has some talent. Paul Molitor was on that team, and he obviously developed into an all time great, one of the best hitters to ever walk this planet. When you coached him and were around him, was there a moment when you went, "Man, this guy is just different." Well, I remember walking on the first practice and, 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 you know, when I first got an opportunity to practice in the first week at school and, and, and I saw Paul take batting practice and I said, Oh boy, Oh boy, that, that's different. That, that ball sounds different coming off his bat than anything I ever heard before. And I told myself right then, my career is going to be cut pretty short here if I have to get that guy out. So I'm going to have to figure out something else to do with my life. And I'm not, uh, I'm not going to, I'm not a very good player. And you looked around at all the talent that was there and, on that team. But when I saw Paul take batting practice and to feel the ground ball and throw it across the diamond, it was like, wow, that's a different I, I, It was never on the same field or in, 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 uh, on the same field as somebody that was that good. And it was, it, there was a difference. There was, uh, you could, no question, there was a difference in terms of his ability and compared to most out there. And uh, that, that jumped out at me. And, um, you know, uh, he, one thing people don't regard is he turned out to be a pretty patient, good eye of the strike zone. When he was in college, he was a free swinger. There wasn't many pitches he didn't like, and he had a pretty big hack. And uh, um, and that changed when he got into professional baseball, and he had to learn how to take a walk because he hit at the top of the lineup and on base percentage and shorten up his swing and use the whole field. Um, that, that became a little bit later. He was a pretty free swinger in college, but uh, didn't swing and miss much. Um, he could score the baseball up, and, and when he did, look out, um, pretty, pretty pretty great player. And uh, the thing I remember most about him was his base running skills, even in college. Tell the story all the time. We're playing Texas spring trip, first uh, time we're outside, and there was a left-hander on the mound. I forget his name from Texas, but he pitched in the big leagues, and Paul was on third base, and George Thomas was coaching third. And Paul was a freshman. He's playing his first couple of games in college baseball. He says to George, I think I can steal home. 
against this lefty. And George says, if you think you can steal, go. So the next pitch, steals home. And Dick was down writing his book or something. And he, Paul shows up in the dugout. And he looks at him and says, how the hell did you get here? <laughs> Paul says, well, I stole home. He goes, you stole home? Who told you to do that? And he said, well, I told George I thought I could do it. And George said, go ahead. And, and, and Dick looked at him and said, that's awesome. He said, if you, if you can do it again, do it again. Later in the game, he did it again against the same guy. Wow. So it just told you that his baseball IQ and his instincts for the game were different than most people. And that's a gift. And um, obviously, I was not surprised at all by Paul's success in, in the big leagues. But probably more importantly, if he hadn't been injured as much as he was, what the record books might look like today. But also, if Robin Yant hadn't decided to go play golf, um, he goes to the minor leagues. And he was at the airport going to AAA, and Robin decided that he was going to not play that year and going to play professional golf because they couldn't agree on a contract. And he came running out the airport to get Paul and get him back there and end up getting a chance in the big leagues. And And if he goes to the minor leagues and has the injuries he has, who knows? His career might not be different than it was today. And then when Robin came back, he moved from short to second. He played some in the outfield, but mostly second. And, and uh, we were talking the other day, and they were replaying the – Brewers World Series, I think, in, in what was it, 82 or something, if I remember right. Um, and uh, and we've, he's, he's come and spoke to our group over the years. And, and um, he's on second base. And we have, I talked to him before about how they, they stole signs back in the days from the catcher's signs from the pitcher and relay them to the hitters. And I was watching the game, and I saw the system he was telling our guys about that he was using. I was laughing. So when I saw him a few days later, I said, yeah, I was watching the replay of that game. I saw you calling signs for Robin the aunt. <laughs> he goes, how do you think Robin got 3000 hits? <laughs> so anyway, um, it's the recipe for success. Yes. So, um, and then I'll, you know, Paul's been a great supporter of myself and my career. And I remember when I got the job, I contacted him and said, Paul, I'm going to need your help and would love to have your support. And, and he told me at that time, he said, John, I'll help you any, in any way I can. You can always ask him if I can, I'll tell you I can't. And um, he was a, a great supporter of mine. And at times when maybe I thought I couldn't do this, he was always there and never second guessed me being hired as a baseball coach. And I think that resonated well with our alumni and others in the community because of his support. And I owe him a great deal for, for how he supported me throughout the year and helped gain, give me some confidence that I could do this. And he obviously learned from Dick Siebert, one of the greats in college baseball, and so many other players were developed by him. I want to know what your favorite Dick Siebert story is. I know you probably have a lot of great ones. Oh, boy. Um, there's a lot of them. No, no question about it. <laughs> um, I remember uh, when I was a student assistant, uh, we were in Texas. We always went to Texas on our spring trip, and we had just bust from – I think we came from Seguin, Texas, and played Texas Lutheran. Got in late up in Austin on the bus, and uh, we we're going to play Texas. And I think we we usually played like back to back double headers or something like that, and and played four games against them. And um, of course, my part of my job was to make sure that uh, you know the bus was cleaned out and everything is off because the bus always went back, didn't stay with us, and. And went back, and you know, I was from the Austin area, and went back to the uh, to shop and turned it in, came back the next day and got us. We were out by the pool playing cards, and all of a sudden I get this raspy voice that comes out. And my nickname back then was Walt, um, and I don't think he knew my first name was John, to be honest with you. And so he goes, oh, Walt, come here. He said, I can't find my hat. <laughs> oh, boy, Okay. And uh, I said, well, you know, you check your room and your bag. You look around. I go over there in his hotel room. We look for it. Can't find it. I think I left it on the bus. And he said, and, and, and he used pretty, you know, fresh language to let me know that your job was to, to make sure that there was nothing left on the bus. And he had put it up on the rack in the corner and I didn't see it. And uh, he said, you get all of that bus company and make sure that that hat's at the ballpark today and we play. Or I'm sending you back to Minneapolis. <laughs> So I get hold of the bus. We had an itinerary. I had a phone number. I called, and they searched and searched and said, nope, couldn't find the hat. Couldn't find it anywhere. I'm sure somebody took it, and they weren't going to fess up that they had it. So I had to go report to him that we couldn't find his hat. And, oh, boy, did I? Did he went up and down me like a window shade because – and I said, well, Chief, we got other hats here. We bought a hat box of extra hats. I'll get you another one. What size do you want? I don't want another hat. That's the hat I want. I broke that hat in. That's my hat. You better go back. You better go to that bus company and find that hat. 
And boy, I, I, uh, I found out quickly that uh, he didn't talk to you a lot, and it's, but he talked to you when you were in trouble or you did something he didn't, didn't approve of. So I'll never forget. And the guys were out the pool and they're watching this and they're, I could see more they're roaring, they're laughing. <laughs> they watch, they're just getting chewed out by the chief. And uh, uh, so um, anyway, um, I'll never, I'll never uh, uh, forget that story. That was one of my first encounters of in front of the group of, of, of many times uh, him reminding me that uh, I needed uh, to do a better job, but uh, you know, he was, he was tough. Um, and then later on, he told me a day later, so I'm really sorry. I was really hard on you, but you know, you got to do a better job. And he, he eventually in his way apologized for the way he acted, but uh, um, and, and, you know, I, I, I accepted that, but uh, you know, again, he was a stickler for the small details and that was a detail and you were supposed to do. It. That's what I brought you for. And uh, so um, uh, I never forgot that story. And uh, it always reminds me that, you know, all the little things do matter to some people. And, and if you have a job to do, you better try to do it right. And, and uh, um, anyway, I, I've never forgotten that. And there's, there's so many stories, uh, great stories that we all have. And we get together as a group. There's, there's just some unbelievable stories that we all remember about what went on. And they're, and they're, they're told out of respect for him and the great teacher that he was and coach that he was. And, uh, uh, but also there's, there's some humorous times and it was a different time than it is today. And you could say, and, 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 and treat some people a little differently than you can today. So he was rough and gruff around the edges. And, and uh, uh, when you didn't perform, he let you know, and it wasn't pleasant sometimes, but that's the way it was back then. You got to learn from him and then pass the torch forward into the future. And I know 2018 was a special group. I had the chance to see it firsthand lineup filled with power, deep pitching staff, awesome chemistry. And I'll never forget the energy at Siebert field during that three, two extra inning win over UCLA. What do you remember about that team and the run that they had? I mean, that was just a special group. Yeah, it was a special group. Um, that was a group that was kind of making for three or four years. Um, and uh, I, I, it really was. And it, I, I've said this many times. It re reminded me of the 77 team. Very, very unselfish. Had a lot of really good players on it. And uh, obviously, we had two freshmen pick up, uh, perform like we never thought they would. And Patrick Fredrickson and Max Meyer, that was something you couldn't have predicted. So to have two freshmen All American like that on the mound was something you didn't, I didn't see that coming, but it happened. But it really, uh, it was a testament to the, the uh, team itself. And I think what really made that team special, a couple of things had to happen. Toby Hansen and uh, Mike Coffey and Alex Boxwell were all juniors. And they had a chance to sign as low, you know, for a minimum amount of money and leave and go into professional baseball. And they all chose to come back. And they were seniors. And we invested a lot of time and energy in player development over three years. And I've said many times, if you can get Minnesota kids to stay four years, you can have a special player by then. And those three coming back really, really changed our lineup significantly. Um, and then Taryn Vavra got healthy, and uh, which he hadn't been able to stay healthy for a full season the first two years and just had a phenomenal year. And I've said many times, you can't have a championship team unless you're strong up the middle. And, uh, you know, Luke Pedersen and, and, and Taryn Vavra, uh, obviously, uh, did a, a fantastic job back there, and, um, and and that made a great difference, along with Eli Wilson behind home plate, and, and Alex Boxwell played center field, and, and, and that team really defensively caught everything, and uh, really made our pitching staff what it was in some ways, because they made so many plays on defense that uh, most teams don't make, whether it's catching balls in the gap, or make turn a, a double play, or making tremendous defensive plays, and so that's another thing that stands out from that team. They're a tremendous defensive team. I've always said you can't be a championship team unless you can play defense and because uh, it, it, it impacts the game in so many ways. And, uh, and, and then the chemistry was unbelievable. And that was not a great spring. We had to ride the bus to Purdue to play Penn State because we couldn't play at home. And all we did is shovel snow. We played Iowa down at Target Field. So it wasn't smooth sailing. We didn't have good weather that year. And whatever the challenge came up, whatever happened that day, whether – we practiced more indoors that spring than we did outdoors. And we I told them, they, they came to my office, said, we'll go anywhere to play Penn State. We'll ride the bus anywhere that we can. We don't care. We just want to play. And so every obstacle that got placed in front of them, they found a way to overcome it. Somebody else found a way to fill in. Alex Boxwell was out for two and a half weeks in, in, in March, and we were at U.S. Bank Stadium. And we found a way to hang in there without him. Toby Anson 
had an injury and somebody, you know, we had other guys fill in and pick up the slack and we just had a very, very unselfish team and it was a special team. And that regional and that year reminded me so much of 1977 and the energy in the stadium. If you go back and look at the pictures of 1977, I sent, sent it out to some of those teammates I found. There are people hanging in the trees behind the old bleachers and we had people roped off inside the, the, the field. They're hanging in the stadium. It was jam packed. And, and the energy in, in Seabirds Field in 18 was very, very similar. And I told myself when it started, I was going to make sure that I took in some of the atmosphere. I didn't know if I'll ever have another opportunity at this. And we built a new stadium. That was the goal. We wanted to host a regional and have an impact on our program. And then to look up in the stands and see alumni all the way back from the middle 50s to players that were on the 2017 team all the way through, that was, that was heartwarming for me to just have – those people, all of our alumni that have supported the program over all these years to be there and be able to partake and be a part of it, that was extremely special to me. And, and that group deserved to be successful because they were motivated, they handled themselves with class, they were unselfish and, 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 and dealt with every uh, piece of adversity that got in their way. And, and uh, that was, a, that was a, a real joy for me and a special, special ride and something I'll never forget. You've turned Minnesota into one of the most consistent programs in the country while playing in the Midwest, which isn't an easy task with the winters that we have. 19 NCAA tourney appearances, 11 Big Ten regular season championships, and you finished in second place or better in the Big Ten 24 times. From your perspective, what are the key traits a program needs to have in order to achieve that level of consistency? Well, talent, first and foremost, uh, but I think... I've said since I learned this from Dick Seward, if we were going to have a consistently good program, and I, I think that's the part I'm most proud of, is we've been consistently pretty good year to year. And uh, there hasn't been big fluctuations. And, you know, we'll have a good team every four or five years and then go to the bottom for the next four or five years. I think that's the part I'm most proud of. But for me, what I learned from Dick Seward is, you know, you had to be a good teacher of the fundamentals of the game. We aren't going to get the best players. We aren't going to get drafted players out of high school. You're going to have to be able to take athletes and kids from the Midwest and the state of Minnesota and through your player development system, you're going to have to turn them into players that can compete on the national level. And it takes time. It takes 200, 250 at bats at the division one level. It takes a lot of player development time, a lot of repetition of the fundamentals and teaching time. I told you Alex Boxwell and, and, and Toby Hansen and Lake Coffee, they're all products of the player development system. It takes that long to get a group of guys to perform at that kind of level to beat up a UCLA in a regional in two games. Um, and so I, I, I think that's been the staple. I've always said, I think we've done a really good job in player development. And I remember in 1991, I think it was um, Mark Marquis from Stanford called me uh, in the office and it was uh, right. This spring training was getting set and he was looking at the rosters of the major league teams in spring training and he called me and said, John, I'm looking at the rosters and there's 10 former University of Minnesota players that are on major league spring training rosters. And he goes, who's really doing the player development here? I know you don't get drafts out of high school and finished products. So what it and he didn't have to call me and tell me that we were colleagues. We weren't great friends, but we were colleagues. And he said, so who's really doing player development? I'm just calling you to compliment you on the player development uh, job that you're doing there at Minnesota, because I know that that's not just about recruiting the best players. That's about taking players and developing them and making them into potential major league players. And so, um, and that reminded me of what I, I believed is we got to be good at player development. And so we have to have find a ways on day-to-day -day basis to get the kids to show up and give us their best effort in terms of trying to create a better version of themselves every day as a player. And then also taking an interest in others and helping other players learn and grow and develop into top line players so we can have a roster of enough guys that we can go out and compete and have a year like we did in 2018. So to have that unselfish culture where people really do care about others and take an interest in helping other people develop as they go along. So I think for me, it's been recruiting number one, you gotta have some talent, but you gotta be able to take that talent in our case, really be good at player development. And, and that's what we continue to try to do. And we practice indoors so much, you gotta try to find a way to develop players indoors that can com compete on the national level. Well, and with player development, when I look at your program, it transcends the field. You're developing players off the field as well and in the classroom. And what do you think is the most rewarding aspect of your job? You've had the opportunity to coach a lot of great players and you've been doing this for a long time. I'm curious to know when you sit down and, and you reflect upon your career, 
what is the most rewarding part of it? The relationships. There's no question. Uh, the relationships, whether it was the relationships that I first met when I joined the program in the fall of 1974 or the, throughout my career, the, the players that have played uh, for myself and our assistants here. I, I think the relationship piece is the thing that has meant the most to me. We call it a family. It's a gopher baseball family. And uh, once you're in the family, uh, when you're in a family, you, you, t you take care of one another and you look out for one another and tell recruits all the time, you know, I hopefully after your career is over, we'll have a relationship that means something and that uh, someday I can help you along the way. And, and, and there'll be a point in time that maybe you can help us. But I want to have a relationship that lasts a lifetime, not just while you're here helping us win a few games, but a lifetime where our relationship means something and we want to stay connected and we made an impact on each other's life in some way. And it's a go for so we call it a family. When you're in a family, you support people through the good and the bad, and 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 and, and days when 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 we need each other, and so and that's why we have alumni functions, events, and we try to bring the Gopher baseball family back together and connect all the different generations of Gopher baseball players. And I've said this many times. My career has really been enhanced because I believe we have the most supportive alumni base of any of the sports programs at the University of Minnesota. I think some of it relates to the stability in the head coaching position. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at myself and George Thomas and Dick Sievert, so 31, 39, uh, and three, so you're over 70 years of, of, of three leaders of the program. And so, so you're able to keep those generations of players and those different groups of alumni connected because there's been stability and leadership. But without the support of alumni base we have, uh, I'm not sure we've had the same success. And I tell the kids every year they come in, you're standing on the shoulders of the guys before you. So you better roll up your sleeves here and decide if you want to be a part of this history and tradition and, and support the efforts of the guys that came before you and, and, and add to that history and tradition because that's what's expected of people that join this program, that we're going to add uh, and, and make that uh, the gold and the golden gopher shine a little brighter. And you're responsible for that. And uh, the, you're responsible to support uh, this program and the history of success that it's had based on the people that came before you. And this is, this, this is a gift. This is, you know, it's, this is not uh, something that's given to everybody. And uh, you've been given a gift and an opportunity here. And uh, we, you better take that and embrace it and, and, and try to add to our history and tradition. John, it's been a pleasure. I think I could sit here and listen to these stories all day. I think you've got a lot more to share. So we'll probably have to have you on again at some point just to uh, touch on all the eras of Gopher Baseball because I think fans really enjoy it. Well, I appreciate it, Daniel. Thanks for having me. And, and like I said, we've been blessed. We have a great history and tradition, but more importantly, the thing I've enjoyed the most is the relationships. And my, my main philosophy is I'm trying to prepare people for the next 50 years of their lives. And I think we've done a pretty good job of that as well in terms of the graduation rate. And I look at the guys out in the community and their jobs and their careers and families and the success stories I hear about every day and our connection together. That's why I do it. I do it to help prepare those. And I love the mentoring piece of my job and taking young young men and molding them and helping them find their way and get them started on their journey. And then and uh, being proud of what they accomplish once they leave the university as well. I think I can speak for a lot of people when this all ends. I'll look forward to heading out to Seabert Field on a beautiful spring day at one of the most underrated ballparks in the Twin Cities, getting a chance to watch your teams play. Thanks for taking the time. Stay safe. I will talk to you soon. Thank you. You take care as well. I think I could listen to John Anderson tell stories all day. There's just so much history with the Gopher Baseball program, and I really appreciate him joining us to share some of his memories. I also want to remind you guys to like and subscribe to Gopher Hole on YouTube. It's completely free. It helps us out, and you'll get notifications when we post a new video. Follow me on Twitter, at Daniel House NFL. And as always, go over to gopherhole.com for the latest news. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you guys next time.